Alrighty, good morning again, everybody. Mentor Fest 2021. Hope you're having a good morning this morning. Alrighty, our next session is is ready to go here. Why else in Amateur Radio? We got Johnny KG5 CPO and team that will be uh, talking about what our YLs are up to here in the North Texas session. So let me turn it over to Johnny and team. Over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Aaron. And good morning. And we are just happy to have this virtual mentor fest. My name is Johnny, Kilo Go 5, Charlie Quebec Oscar. And guess what? You are lucky. You are the first to hear about a new page that has just been added to the North Texas section of the ARRL website. The title of the page is Young Ladies and Amateur Radio. This page was developed to provide resources to anyone interested in becoming a ham, but its main focus will be the ladies who want to become a ham. Plus, we are going to be celebrating young ladies involved in amateur radio, and we will start with the North Texas section. This new area is going to provide everyone with information, such as, what does YL refer to? Well, it refers to young ladies who are also amateur radio operators. Plus, young does not refer to anyone's age. So those of you who know me know, yep, I'm still considered a YL. Why have a page dedicated to YLs? Well, each month we are going to want to highlight YL for their achievement. It could be something very small, you know, like building a tape measure antenna. Could be something kind of large, like getting the most contacts in a contest. We want to make all hams aware of the various achievements made by ladies in amateur radio. We hope to continue this over the course of months. Ooh, and yes, hopefully years. This page will also include a did you know section. This section is where anyone can learn about past achievements of ladies in amateur radio. There have been many ladies who have outstanding achievements in our past. I'm hoping you are going to check out the new page periodically and learn about many lady hams from the past. There is also going to be a section of Instagram accounts. We are aiming to attract younger ladies into the hobby. And the best way to do this is to use some type of media like Instagram. And then we can highlight them monthly and post pictures doing hopefully ham related activities. This in turn should encourage more young ladies to explore amateur radio. Lastly, we have resources at the end. We wanted to help all new hams, but especially ladies. We will also include a way for you to contact us if you have any questions or if anyone wants to make a comment. We would like those of you who visit this page to make recommendations. If you have a lady you'd like us to highlight or you know something about YLs in the past, let us know. Now, if you recommend someone, you're going to have to send me their full name, their call sign, and their email address. Because as when putting stuff out, I will need to have permission to post about them. We want this page to become a place that we answer questions for most ladies who are usually in this hobby. Please check the page out and let us know what you think. Oh, and please tell your wives, your daughters, your aunts, your nieces about these pages. And let your club know, make them aware of the new resource. I can hardly wait to hear what you have to say about the page, because I know it's going to get better as it grows. Now you're going to hear a little more from the other members of the team that helped make this page possible. Thanks for listening, and I will see you again near the end of the presentation. So our next speaker is Michelle Caraway, W5MQC. 
she is part of YLRL, which is the Young Ladies Radio League. And she is specifically the District 5 chairwoman. And District 5 happens to be our district. Good to see you, Michelle. Let's hear what you have to say. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, to everyone who's out there listening and watching today, thank you for being here. The Young Ladies Radio League is celebrating its 82nd anniversary this year. In May, in the May 1939th issue of QST Magazine, the editor placed a lace-bordered ad reaching out to women operators um, asking them if they read the book 200 Meters Down. And even though the preface of the book mentions women, they weren't mentioned in the book. So he wanted to know, where are the women? There was a single reply, and it was posted in the July 1939th issue. It was Ethel Smith. She asked all the YLs to contact her, and they would organize themselves and call it the Young Ladies Radio League. And 82 years later, we're still active today. Everyone knows that there are major parts of the hobby. DXing, contesting, the expeditions, roving. The list goes on and on. We all know everybody has a favorite part that they do. But as Johnny mentioned earlier, there is another subset. Next slide. The YL, the young lady. Next slide. There are many controversies over the definition of a YL, and those that have been around for a while have heard it all. Um, I know most of you know what YL stands for, but do you know where did it come from? It all started in an ARRL traffic report. It was signed by E.C. Adams on May 13, 1920, to Miss Adair Garmhausen, 3 Bravo Charlie Kilo responding to an article she submitted to QST. In it, he called her my dear YL. So ladies and gentlemen, the licensed lady should always be called YL regardless of her age, just as Johnny said earlier, and the same as licensed men are always called OM. Next slide. Back to the YLRL, in 1939, the Young Ladies Radio League was legally created. I actually had a copy of those incorporation documents as I was setting up for the 2018 convention. In November 1939, the first newsletter was done. And then they decided in December of 1939 to name the publication YL Harmonics. And that is still the name of the magazine that goes out quarterly today. The Young Ladies Radio League's mission is still the same as it was back in 1939, to encourage and assist young ladies to promote YL interest, appreciation, and an understanding of ham radio and to improve their skills, much like what they're doing in the North Texas district of ARRL. Next slide. During World War II, even First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, after reading an article by Anita Bean, Whiskey 8, Tango Alpha Yankee, acknowledged the YL role. She commented, the work of the League was an inspiration. We should all be an inspiration. Next slide. Young Ladies Radio League sponsors several contests, certificates, support events, and some of them are even open to OMs. I'm going to talk about a couple of them. Next slide. There are two contests. One is in February, and that is the YLOM contest. And ladies, it just usually happens to land right around Valentine's weekend. So, if you're single looking for someone who else is into ham radio, that may be an opportunity to uh, reach out to some OMs or to meet them. Um, in October, the YL, y, YL, um, CQYL party where you get as many other YLs as you can, that's in October and that's a fairly fun one. Next slide. Some certificates that everybody can earn. 
worked all state, YL worked all states, YL DXCC, YL worked all continent, YLCC worked 100 different YLs. I know there are probably some of us out there that are really close to that one. Next slide. Some YL only certificates, uh, continuous membership. Um, you get a that little diamond, you get your first certificate at five years, and then for every five years of membership in the Young Ladies Radio League, you get another little diamond for there. I know some of the ladies have been in the club for a, for a very long time, as they gave me copies of some of their YL mnemonics from the 50s. Very interesting. The second one is my favorite, um, the Annual Friendship Award. Uh, each year, they change what the exchange is. So you want to get the goal of the certificate, of course, is to help ladies um, get over that fright, that mic fright that everybody seems to get into. It's not exclusive to ladies, but um, this one is meant where you have to contact 15 other YLs. You have a whole year to do it. You exchange your name, QTH, and whatever the exchange that year is. This year it happens to be national parks. Now, it, there is a little trick to it in that you can't duplicate the park. So for me, my favorite national park is Denali National Park in Alaska. So if you contact two YLs and they both have the same park, you can't count both of them. You can only count one of them. So, but you have the whole year to do it. And there are a ton of national parks. Last year, it was your favorite bird. Every year it changes. It's a fun one. It's good to get out and learn with this one. Next slide. The YLRL also has two scholarships and they are given to full-time full YL students. One is to honor the founding mother, Ethel Smith K4LMB, which happens to also be our club call sign. And one to honor Mary Lou Brown, November Mike, seven November. Both ladies are silent keys. Next slide. Conventions. The last one I was the host of, it was here in, uh, it was up in Oklahoma City in 2018. Uh, they do rotate districts. They have them every three to four years, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. I'm not sure where they will have it um, when they're, you know, when everything all opens up, but they do alternate districts. And as soon as they do, we'll put that information out. It was really fun. I I think we had over a hundred ladies there last year. I mean, in 2018, it was a blast. We had a lot of fun. It's nice to get together with so many YLs. Next slide. If you want to find out more information on the Young Ladies Radio League, you can go to the website ylrl.org. It's only $15 a year to join us. Um, if you have questions about District 5 YL activities, we usually have some fun. I try to have two different activities throughout the year. We'll go activate, like we usually go in October and activate the USS Batfish up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And we have ladies that come from all over to participate in that one. We also try to do a fun one. Last year, just before the COVID hit, we did a kit building class down there in Plano, Texas. Um, the year before that, we did one right in the middle of um, storm season, and we got hit with a storm, so we didn't actually get to do it. But um, we did set up and have some good, um, some good mentoring with each other. But you can email me, w5mqc at yahoo.com. You can join our, our Facebook. We have a District 5 First Facebook page. We have a newsletter we send out each month. And um, come join the fun. Thanks for taking time um, to join us today. And with that, Johnny, I will send it back to you. Thank you, Michelle. I really enjoyed that. Even being a member of your group, I still learn lots of new things. And hey, I didn't know about that certificate with the parks and all. I need to try to do that one. And this is a good way uh, for anyone who wants to introduce a YL that they know to the uh, hobby of ham radio is simply to go join this league and visit their webpage. Very nice. All right, our next speaker is Catherine Forsum, KD5 KMF. 
She is the ARRL North Texas Section Youth Coordinator. And this young lady is definitely going places. I have known her for a few years and she became a ham radio operator, if I got it right, when she was nine years old. Now, she wasn't able to stay with us today, but she will explain that, but she has done a nice video for us. So here is Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine, KT5KMF. I really wish I could be here live with all of you today, but as this presentation is happening, I'm on my way to Oklahoma for Sooner Saturday, um, a college visit at OU. If you have any questions about my part of the presentation, you can ask Johnny at the end, or you can contact me by email at kt5kmf at gmail.com. I've been in the position of ARRL North Texas Section Youth Coordinator for about two years now. And my role as the youth coordinator is to find ways to help youth become interested in amateur radio, as well as to connect with youth who are licensed to help them find ways to stay involved in the hobby. So when Johnny reached out to me about her plans to create a YL web page, I suggested creating an Instagram account to go along with the page to reach more of the younger YLs out there. So this Instagram page will contain information that is also found on the website, such as the spotlights and facts about the history of YLs. And we'll also link to the website to direct those exploring the Instagram account there. The Instagram page also has posts introducing each of us, the contributors to the website, and a bit about our experiences in ham radio. The page was just made public this morning, so anyone who wants to see it will be able to do so without us having to accept your follow request. So first, for those who do not have an Instagram account, you will not be able to follow the page without making one first. Um, if you do want to make an account, all you need is an email address. You enter your email, create a username and a password, and are then sent an email asking you to confirm your email address. From there, you are able to follow other accounts on Instagram. If you would prefer not to make an account, you can search Ladies in Ham Radio with no spaces on Google, and the Instagram website should come up as one of the first search results. Um, from there, you can view the page without having to log in. For those of you that do have an account and want to follow the page, first go to Instagram.com and sign in to your account, uh, if you haven't already. Next, search for Ladies in Ham Radio. Again, with no spaces in the search bar at the top center of the page. The YL account is the first search result that comes up, so click on this search result. Then click the blue follow button next to the username. So on my screen, it says requested since the video was recorded before the account was public, but yours should instead now say following. Uh, from there, you can see all of the account's posts as well as have new posts show up in your feed. If you have an Instagram account already and would like some other ham radio Instagram accounts to follow, ARRL and the ARRL North Texas section both have them. And you can also follow my personal ham radio account, KT5KMF, and the Young Ladies Radio League account as well. And the usernames for those, if you'd like to follow them, are all shown on this slide. Thank you all so much for being here. 
and I hope you enjoy the presentation as well as learn a lot about YLs in amateur radio. All right, before we go to our next speaker, uh, we are going to have Aaron come in and tell us about something special going on with each presentation. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you, Johnny. Yeah, I think it's time for our first door prize. And so, uh, just a quick reminder how this will work in the in the link uh, description below. There's a link to the entry form, uh, which is now open. And in that form, uh, it'll ask you a couple of quick questions so we know where to send your prize. Again, you got to be in the um, continental United States and have an amateur radio license. And your address that's on file with the FCC slash what we're going to find in QRZ is where we're going to send it. When you're filling out the form, the key phrase that you need for this session is lady hams are the best. Uh, so we're going to have that form open for 10 minutes and then uh, we'll go ahead and close entries at that point and then at the end of the session uh, we will pick a random winner and uh, get that first door prize awarded. Thank you Johnny, back over to you. Ah, thank you, Aaron, and good luck to everyone who has been listening. So our next speaker is Allison Hoye, KG5BHY. At present time, she is vice president of the Manfields Johnson Amateur Radio. She is also the founder of the YL North Texas Weekly Net and is the liaison for Burleson EOC. With her, and after listening to the rest of us, you are going to see that we are a very eclectic group, which means the web page that we have developed should cover lots of different areas. Allison, what do you have to share with us today? Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Johnny, for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, welcome to MentorFest. And uh, my name is Allison Oye, and I am the Vice President of the Mansfield Johnson Amateur Radio Service. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about getting started climbing and how to stay safe. Uh, I've been climbing for approximately four years. Never really sat, uh, set out to learn to climb, but it was one of those things that just kind of evolved. Uh, our club started putting up and maintaining repeaters, and at the time we only had two climbers. So fun fact, acrophobia, otherwise known as the fear of heights, is one of the most common phobias out there. And lucky me, I don't have it. So I set out to learn to climb. And as a side note, as usual, uh, these sorts of things always run under time constraints. So we're going to fly fast and low. And hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Next. So no matter what aspect of climbing you're considering, whether it be finding an Elmer, purchasing equipment, finding climbing opportunities, or maintaining situational awareness, at the end of the day, absolutely everything comes down to safety. So this morning, we're gonna take a dive into each of these four categories and investigate the safety aspects tied to each. Next. So let's start with finding an Elmer. The best way to find an Elmer is to ask people you trust for, for names of individuals that they trust. Next. Next. You want to look for someone who has a long-standing safety record because, of course, that has everything to do with safety, has an attention to detail, has a calming demeanor. The last thing you want is somebody yelling at you from the ground. Next, one of the biggest things you want to look for in an Elmer is someone who puts your safety first. And this means helping you inspect the tower, helping you inspect your climbing gear once you're wearing it, especially in the beginning. My Elmer made sure that every cinch and every buckle was fastened and fastened correctly. He also taught me to tape down the ends of loose straps with gaffer's tape so that nothing became unfastened while I was climbing. You also want to find someone confident enough to take the heat if they feel it necessary to veto a potentially dangerous climb. Because I can assure you, if that happens, your tower owner is not going to be happy. And of course, you want to find someone who will climb with you on larger climbs 
or coach you from the ground on smaller climbs. By the way, I wanna take the opportunity to say that there will be a reference page at the end of this presentation, which will contain some other stuff. Next, uh, once you have a name of someone you're considering, go hang out, be part of the ground crew and watch, watch them climb. Do they observe the basic rules of climbing? And also, everyone has a different climbing technique. So climb with others or watch from the ground and see what you can learn without picking up bad habits. All right, now we're gonna visit about equipment. One of the most overlooked tools that you have as a tower climbing uh, tool is your own body. When you make that decision to climb, you're gonna have some epiphanies as far as what kind of shape you're actually in. Next. Be truthful with yourself and consider, are you personally fit to climb? Be aware of your physical limitations, whether that be your actual physical fitness level or your height. I'm five foot tall. There are some towers that I physically just cannot climb due to the spacing between the rungs. It also means being aware of your personal fitness level. And uh, I can tell you that the day after I climb, my biceps hurts, my quads hurt, my glutamus maximus maximus hurts. I have bruises everywhere and I cannot tell you where they came from. So climbing is a full body workout. If the only place you're going is up, trust me, it's cardio. Plus you're lifting your body up over and over and over again with your legs. So it's a strength workout. Also as a side note, you should be able to do a pill up and you should be able to have the hand strength to open and close your lanyards. And if that means sitting in front of the TV and practicing until you can open and close them flawlessly, repetitively over and over again, then that's what it means. Also be aware it is definitely a mental workout. It's normal to be apprehensive, but if you're absolutely terrified, you might wanna reconsider your plan. On the other hand, most climbers are afraid of heights and so that's kind of what keeps them conscientious and safe. The point is, if you let it, climbing will definitely get into your head. On the day before, you need to hydrate like crazy, drink Gatorade, pickle juice, or take any electrolyte supplements, anything that you need to do to keep yourself hydrated. Eat healthy, rest up, and just be. And on the morning of, especially for you ladies, Quit drinking fluids about two hours before you climb. Ask me what significance that has. Okay, now we're gonna talk about actual equipment. First of all, it's not cheap. So you may wanna borrow equipment at first, but if you're serious about climbing, you need to purchase well-fitting ANSI rated equipment as soon as possible. ANSI, by the way, is the American National Standards Institute and they're a nonprofit organization who set standards for a multitude of things, including personal protective equipment. Also, some things are gonna be more okay to borrow than others. Borrowing a lanyard is fine. Harnesses, maybe not, it depends. I'm five foot tall. I cannot borrow a climbing harness from a six foot tall man and expect it to fit properly. There's only so many adjustments that you can be made. You want to be sure that when you purchase your equipment that you specifically purchase a fall protection harness, not a rock climbing harness. This is important. Fall protection is a full body harness with D-ring attachments that are either on the front, on the back, or on the sides. The placement of these attachment points has advantages based on the application at hand and your personal preference. For instance, the D-ring on the back is great for Y straps, which is great for climbing water towers that have rebar ladders. A D-ring on the front is great if you're climbing a water tower with a trolley. Some people prefer the attachments on the sides, but either way, it all comes down to personal preference. But the one thing you do not wanna do is accidentally buy a rock climbing harness, and here's why. These only go around the waist and legs and they're great for, walk, for rock climbing because if they fall, 
They can conceivably fall from a variety of angles. As a tower climber, you're gonna fall vertically. And so what you need is a full body harness. Next. Safety straps, AKA lanyards, come in a myriad of types, lengths, number of clips, et cetera. There are shock absorbing and non-shock absorbing lanyards. Uh, there's at least two types of clips that I know of, and there's probably more. As for lanyard links, they all have their application. An 18 inch strap is great for trolley work. A six foot strap is great for climbing personal towers because you can hook to the D-ring on one side and then wrap the strap through and around the tower legs and then hook to the other side of your harness and they're, you're, you're bound in. Y straps again are great for climbing water towers. Again, there's no right and wrong, but some tools will work better for the job. And then it comes down to personal preference. Shorter climbs might be okay for a bucket and a lid and, uh, and not having a top and easy access. But if you're climbing up a water tower, 250 feet, you're probably not gonna wanna do that. You're gonna wanna carry a backpack. But then again, the longer, the more you carry, the, the more tired you're gonna become. Okay, all right. So you've got your number, you've got your equipment, and now you gotta find yourself some climbing opportunities. Okay, warning here. Word of mouth is always the best way to advertise, but be cautious because fear of heights is a common phobia, but it does not prevent amateur radio operators from putting up their own towers. And so, also, time happens. The climber who put up their own tower 25 years ago may not be able to climb it now, and now it's a 25-year-old tower. The point is, towers are forever. They need a lot of attention, but that doesn't mean that they're all safe to climb. Finding opportunities is not going to be hard, trust me. Next. But basically, climbs fall into four different types. There's existing personal towers, new installs of personal towers, indoor water towers, and outdoor water towers. Existing towers often offer shorter climbs, meaning they're less than 100 feet. And as a whole, you prob they're probably the least safe to climb because they've been exposed to the elements for longer. You will feel more movement as you go higher on these towers because they're smaller. And you're gonna have more obstacles to contend with because basically you've got a lot of stuff packed into a much smaller space. Also, if you're a tower owner, can I just throw this out there? Please, please, please spend the money and buy stainless steel hardware. It is not a fun thing as a climber to get to the top of the tower only to realize that you're basically useless because you can't loosen a rusted nut. And as for climbers, carry Loctite. New towers present their own set of issues. There's a fun new challenging game in town called Who Can Find a Gin Pole? And she who wins gets a lifetime supply of LMR 400 and Sterling Silver PL 259s to go with it. But I digress. Tower installs are long haul events, so you're gonna get multiple opportunities to climb. Also, most towers are purchased secondhand, and I can guarantee you any, minute, any amount of dry fitting that you do on the ground and marking basically evaporates the minute it's hoisted in the air. Absolutely everything you thought you knew will evaporate into dust. Indoor water towers have virtually no movement, but again, they're much longer climbs. You're talking 250 feet and up. You climb in and out of darkness, uh, which means you need to be prepared for the, event, for the effects of light changes on your body. It can wreak havoc on your equilibrium. Outdoor towers are basically the same gig as indoor, except, well, you know, they're outdoor. But that also means that you're going to be dealing with bird spikes, affectionately known as man eaters. And if you're not dealing with bird spikes, you're probably going to be dealing with other bird stuff or birds. In all climbs, I'm going to emphasize that there will be wasp nests, birds nests, etc. 
I was up on a tower about 250 feet one time with another female and I was watching as she was uh, working on a piece of mesh equipment and gently shooing away wasps. And about that time, she, she mentioned that she was allergic to bees. Please carry an EpiPen if you're allergic to flying things. I'm just throwing that out there. Also, uh, one time I helped an HF uh, take down an HF Yagi for a silent key. And when we tilted over the five inch pole to haul it off, out came a bunch of fossilized squirrels. So you will have uh, fauna. Next, situational awareness. There are a lot of things to keep an eye on when you climb. Things like power lines, next. Mally ground crews, which are definitely distractions. Uh, we would never bust each other's chops, right? Wasp, uh, equipment issues like your glasses slipping or fogging. I cannot climb with my glasses. Hat slipping, glove slipping, it's very distracting. Uh, no matter how well they fit, I always have a problem with my gloves slipping, so I personally hate them. I'd rather have my hands just torn to heck than wear them. You need to be aware of tricky transition spots, uh, things like uh, having coax in the way. Again, never step on coax. Uh, ropes and guy wires that cause trip hazards. Basically, anywhere you have a danger spot, a transition is going to be a danger spot, whether it's transitioning to a catwalk or transitioning from a ladder to the top of the tower. Not being the moment is another danger. Uh, you get into a rhythm and you get lulled into complacency and you think you're doing just fine, but it's at that point that you actually will make a mistake. So every single move that you make needs to be conscientiously made. Also, and this is one that gets overlooked, going up is not the same as going down. When you're going down, you've worked hard for however many hours you've been up on that tower and you're fatigued. Plus, as you go up, you have the advantage of crossing a trouble spot basically twice in order to recognize the obstacle. Once with your head when you pass it and then you tell your feet to move. But when you're going down, you have to constantly look downward for obstacles. Next. So now we're down to it. Here are the basic rules of climbing. Never climb anything you haven't thoroughly inspected. And part of my real life job is that I work with the oil and gas industry and specifically in pipeline. And so I can tell you that there are some really interesting chemical reactions that happen between concrete and steel. And not every issue that you, uh, that you will face can be seen with the eyes. And again, there's gonna be a reference page at the end of this. Um, and for reasons that I hope are abundantly clear, never climb alone, never free climb. Free climbing is climbing without a harness, never, never, never. Um, be slow, be methodical, and be purposeful. Maintain three points of contract, contact with the tower at all times, and at least one of those needs to be a hook. And lastly, anyone on the ground crew needs to be wearing a hard hat. I've seen screws fall, and I've seen screwdrivers fall, and I can guarantee you screwdrivers do a lot more damage. So gravity is real. Next. After you've thoroughly considered all of these things, the only thing left to do is just buckle up your guts and do it. Enjoy it, because not a lot of people will ever get to experience that view. It's incredible, and uh, you might as well enjoy the day. Uh, it's it's an amazing hobby, and uh, it's it's there's not a lot of people who will do it. So if you're interested, by all means, go for it. Also, I want to mention the Wild North Texas Weekly Net on Monday nights at 8 p.m. here in the DFW area. Uh, the information here is for uh, the local repeater. Uh, if you cannot make that, the Echo Link node is uh, my call sign, KG5BHY-L. Uh, my contact information is there. And then lastly, let's hit those resources. All right. These are great links. Uh, this guy, Tyler Lay, Lee, not sure how he pronounces it, has a background in structural engineering, and he has a whole channel 
based on concrete and corrosion and different things, science experiments and that sort of thing. He is amazing. This one particular video is great about corrosion and concrete and how it happens. Also, uh, DX Engineering has a great uh, five-part series on intro to climbing and everything from, you know, how to stay safe and inspect a tower and, you know, all about fall rest gear and climbing. Uh, it's, it's a great resource. So with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you and hand it back to Johnny and see if you have any questions. Thank you. I almost forgot to press my unmute button. So for the end here, I simply want to uh, say my appreciation first to all three presenters. As I said before, you can see that we are a very eclectic group. And even though our main focus is for the YLs, we will also have resources available for everyone. I also need to give a special thanks to Aaron because he helped us put together the web page. He said, what do you want? We told him, he put it up, we made adjustments. So what you get to see, which is live now, uh, is the doings of him. So thanks very much. I also have to thank Steve Smith because, you know, I went to him and said, let's do a YL page. He said, sure, let's go for it. And between Steve and Greg, they make sure to keep us uh, meeting all the requirements for doing uh, a page like this. I can also mention that uh, on the bottom of our page where we have resources for you, the one in the middle will bring you to two spots. One goes to the ARRL page where nets are listed, where you can find the net that uh, Allison was talking about. And the second one underneath will bring you to YL nets that I got from uh, Michelle, which actually can be all over the world. So they're there for a resource to you. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and we'll check our page out. And now we go back to Aaron to see if we have any questions. All righty, well, thank you much, Johnny, Allison, um, Michelle, Catherine. I, it was my pleasure to work on the webpage. I was so excited when, when you mentioned it. I was uh, very, very excited to work on that. Um, Kilo 8 Alpha Mike Hotel, I'm kind of your moderator this morning. And if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the live chat. We don't have any at the moment, Johnny. Uh, which is usually a good sign that you did an excellent job of, of presenting things. So thank you much this morning. And uh, for folks that are looking for the, the young ladies page, I did mention it uh, in the chat that's running along the side of the video there, but uh, section webpage, ARRLNTX.org, and you'll find the uh, young ladies option uh, new and live this morning up on, on the menu bar there on the section website. So. Um, not looking like we're getting um, any questions. Um, again, if, if you do have any, you're welcome to reach out to Steve. You can reach out to Johnny. The contact form is on the young ladies page there as well. And um, if, if no questions, Johnny, everybody, thank you so much this morning. Appreciate you coming in and, and telling us what's going on with the young ladies. Thank you for having us.